Welcome everyone, a warm welcome to this uh, second dialogue on dialogue on development re research, uh, which is organized by SCI, Development and Aid Policy Team, and SWEDEV, the Swedish Development Researchers Network. My name is Janet Vahamaki, and I'm the team leader for the DAP team and director for SWEDEV. So shortly, just it's the DAP team, Development Aid Policy Team at SCI, was formed in September. 2022 was a response to an internal project looking at development dimensions of the SCI's work. And despite that, SCI is conducting a lot of work within the development field and has a dual mandate, uh, development and environment. It has mainly been recognized as, uh, recognized as an environment think tank so far. So the DAP team uh, works with issues related to human development and environment uh, from local to global scale. And Swedev, we are a member-based network constituted in November 2019. Uh, the network works with strengthening collaboration within the research community and with increasing interaction between development researchers and practitioners. With these dialogues uh, and this series of dialogues, we want to spread findings of development research. Uh, it should be a learning space where development researchers around the world can share and discuss their work with other researchers and practitioners and policymakers. So to this dialogue today, we're happy to introduce our speaker, Stefan Derkon. You know, I have, I've been extremely lucky in the last 30 years in terms of the career I've been able to have up to now. I've been an academic for 30 years. And I'm very much a microeconomist, studying really at a micro level what happens to households, rural households, sometimes urban workers, um, and in different parts of the world, although mainly in Africa, although some work in South Asia and a bit in Latin America as well. Um, what I think um, allowed me to do a little bit more is that beyond, you know, writing the papers and talking to a lot of people on the ground, I've always been able to... Um, at least have a link with policy and but often for an academic that means go and talk a lot but since 2011 i've been closely involved with first with diffit and now with the fcdo so basically with the uk development operation you know as an academic as an outsider i'm not at the time when i was becoming chief economist of diffit i wasn't even british um i'm belgian of birth and um i i have been able to actually also working at a very senior level, meeting with very senior people, and some will recognize some of the people I have in the middle panel of the, of the picture, and to actually engage with them and making, making me think a bit about, about development, about the big picture of it. Okay, so while I'm a researcher and I work on the, the as a researcher tend to do, answering small questions very well, a lot of the work I've been doing, and the one that's reflected in the, in the book, and also I want to talk about it, is actually about the big picture and you know and i think the big picture matters because the big picture is fascinating is interesting is positive and worrying at the same time this is a picture that many of you you will recognize this comes from the data from our world in data uh, an excellent source for any data that you ever want to use in, in and, and publicly available and this basically tells us between 1990 and 2018 you know, the number of extreme poor people in the world. Now we could have a whole seminar and in fact, a whole workshop and weeks of work on definitions of poverty. I use here the kind of the extreme poverty idea as in the World Bank uh, is being trying to do because it allows us to at least compare between countries and between over time, uh, allowing for cost of living differences and purchasing power, parity differences. If we're in 1990, we have probably about 2 billion people poor, just under that are using that definition. And most of them are in this red block, which is actually East Asia, um, which largely is in this particular case, uh, actually China, about 800 million extreme poor people in China. The orange bit is South Asia, and that's of course mainly India in terms of population. And we were uh, at that time, you know, easily uh, 50, 60% of the Indian population would be in extreme poverty. The blue one is Africa. It's relatively small relative to the other areas because actually Sub-Saharan Africa is rather small in population and definitely at the time it was. Now, what we get is the evolution and the evolution shows that heterogeneity, massive progress 
in the Red Bloc, which is basically the massive poverty reduction in China, starting in the uh, mainly in the 1990s, that actually started a little bit before as well. Then we get in the orange bit in South Asia, and especially in India, somewhere from the mid noughties that the data started to show a systematic decline in this extreme poverty. Now, it doesn't mean that people are uh, not deprived anymore, that they are rich people now, of course not, but it's that first step that is very striking. And Sub-Saharan Africa, the blue, well, there the story is, if anything, it's been increasing very slowly. It's as a share of the population, it's gone down, but we are probably by 2018, the last year of the data that are publicly available would be about 450 million people. Of course, we know with COVID, on this total number of about 500, 550 million people globally in the world in extreme poverty, we worry that about 150 million people have been added, which would mean, if you look at this picture, we've, we've gone back about maybe six or seven years. Okay, so it's not that it's totally back to, to, to disastrous situation, but of course, we had a backlash. Still, what is so important, it's not just a story between Africa staying behind and Asia going ahead, and South Asia be it slower than, than China. Actually, I find really the most interesting thing over the years that I've been working also and across, across the world in so many different places, is that actually we start getting heterogeneity even in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I think that's a really important bit. We, we had, you know, Africa has a lot of countries, uh, but some of them are quite small, but of the 18 countries that have more than 8 million population by 1919 and more than 20% uh, extreme poverty, there's only two that have been able to halve their extreme poverty in that period. Which is, which is Ghana and Ethiopia. But then a number of others, about seven, have actually doubled the number in extreme poverty. Now that's differentiation. Some really doing quite well in this period, others really quite poorly. And you see these names, and especially the DRC, Nigeria, Madagascar will always come out in the data, probably Malawi, Zambia as well as the, as the next ones in terms of the large increases. Now, that is also reflected simply in the economic sense. And whatever discussion we would have, when we look at GDP, um, basic GDP figures reflect the same patterns. You know, there's no country that in a sustainably way, sustainable way, sustainable in the sense that in a durable, in, in, a, in, a, in a sustained way, uh, reduced extreme poverty uh, without actually getting their economies to grow. Because this economy started in 1990, are really relatively small. You know, the most of them were beyond uh, $2,000 in 2011 prices in purchasing power. Parity actually would mean most of them were low-income countries with most usual definitions uh, um, in, in this picture. But then you see some actually have flat evolution. We could talk more about them, but Nigeria, the DRC, that very little has been happening. Nigeria, there's only this jump, largely because of new data, uh, kind of a new way of calculating GDP at some point. It would have been otherwise flat. Otherwise, you get certain countries, and of course, China, the strongest mover, but then you also get Indonesia that had to sustain movement after a blip in 97 at the Asian crisis, but then you get India, Vietnam, but also Bangladesh and Ethiopia actually being quite considerably better off than they were around 1990. And these are the kind of countries I want to talk about. And actually my question is really, what, why is it that these countries in this recent period evolve in a quite a different way um, relative to some of the more stagnant places like the DRC or Malawi or Nigeria, and indeed where poverty has been increasing quite a lot. What, what do these places have in common? And so that's actually, of course, an old question in development economics that usually gets addressed by, you know, methods that I definitely will not touch anymore, cross-country growth regressions, there's so many flaws in it, we can't quite do it. And in the book, I don't try to do it like that. I'm actually trying to do it in form of case studies. I'm looking for common elements in a large number of countries that, uh, that, that we're dealing with. Um, of course, it's not, I'm not the first one that, that tries to have big picture questions around all these people. And I'm, it's a bit like a pop quiz type of thing, you know, how many do you recognize of these big names? But I can assure you, they've all written best-selling books in economic development in the last 15 years. Um, but I'm giving away now the titles. These are the kind of typical books that people end up reading. Now, I'm not saying these are the best ones, or these are the ones that you should be reading, although I think they're worthwhile reading. 
they have a very diverse set of views and they, they, they talk about the big picture idea, you know, how does poverty gets uh, reduced, um, how, how do countries grow and, and do get better off and with very different views of aid and so on. When you start reading them, and I reread them again, writing this book, you know, you, 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 I'm very struck how much they always focus on what needs to be done, the kind of policies that needs to be done. And in fact, most of our profession seems to be obsessed with trying to say, these are the things we need to be doing as development economists or other development experts, what to do and what not to do. And of course, it's important because <laughs> you would like countries to do the right thing. But when you read and dig a bit deeper in these books, you have actually two big competing diagnoses that actually probably, you know, still stand after 20 years and the people are still fighting between the two, between these two big groups. One is probably best encapsulated in, you know, the why nations fail view of Asimoglu and Robinson, where it basically says, you know, well, you can only do development if you get your institutions right. Okay. Now, I think there's something interesting worthwhile in it. But um, for me, the question is really, uh, where does it lead us, you know? And, and when you read Why Nations Fail, it actually can be quite a depressing book because the best policy advice you seem to be giving is actually, um, well, sorry, you got the wrong history. Why didn't you try to get yourself a better history? Because the institutions tend to be determined through history. They tend to be shaped like that. And now you kind of get into this sense like, you know, well, I'm sorry, you have a bad history about colonial history and other type of other bits of history. Well, that's it. And development in, and in their view, you get a sense that development only can start once you get that sorted, you know, and it's, it's a pretty depressing view, actually, to actually say, well, you know, buy yourself another history or I'm going to make you another history. No, these are things that slowly change over there. But there is more to it. When we look at the success stories of recent times that have grown fast and that, uh, that have grown fast and, and reduced poverty considerably, and then we're thinking about, you know, the Chinas, but also the Indonesias, the Bangladeshis, the Ghanas, the Ethiopias on the list that I have, they're very flawed countries. Their institutions were definitely not uh, looking like uh, what well, Asimogli Robinson or before that Douglas North would have said you needed to have. So actually, a lot of development takes place in imperfect institutions. Let me quickly say this importantly for China. You know, China, the biggest success story. China in 1979, when we date this progress, was an absolute disaster. In fact, many of us, and I was very young then, but I do remember the discussions about whether China would survive or not, because it had come out of the Cultural Revolution. It had done in the 1970s that Mao died and then the Gang of Four, for those who remember that history, Mao's widow, there was a huge power struggle going in the party and there was just no more clarity and no more clarity in terms of what the party was doing. It was actually all ideology and no pragmatism, no policy, nothing was happening. And by 1979, you know, when the reformers under Deng Xiaoping got the upper hands in the party congress, you know, there was no one who thought that, oh, surely now China will grow for the next 40 years. There was definitely not that sense. This was an absolute gamble for them. You know, making statements suddenly like, oh, well, we know that party, the, the central party and the ideology has kept this country, uh, kept us in power in this country. Now we're going to have sayings like, it doesn't matter whether the cat is white or black as long as it catches mice. Or basically saying, it doesn't matter whether we use capitalism or communism, it doesn't matter as long as we grow the economy. And you do that in a moment when there's none of the normal uh, conditions for a market economy to emerge. That is actually a real gamble and it's really very, uh, very much against this kind of big hypothesis. Now, um, and another part of it, of course, with this institutional view is to simply say, well, you know, it is all history and that's what success will be. And in fact, you know, if, if James Robinson would be sitting here, would say, yeah, but China won't succeed. OK, maybe not, but it's been doing quite well for a long time. Maybe in 50 years, we'll see. Um, we will see. And, and maybe it's too, too, too early to tell. But there is an issue there. So why 1979? If it's if it's uh, or indeed, why did some of the other success stories across history, 
wait for that particular moment in time to, to go. If it's all about getting the institutions, uh, they seem to be evolving, but why does the Industrial Revolution start when it started? Or why in 1979, in one place, as in Ghana, I would say in the 1990s, where something dramatically began to change. Uh, and in Ethiopia, probably 2005, after a first move in 1991. Why then and not before? And actually, why do success stories what they wait for? Now, of course, you could say, okay, that's the moment they got their policies right. Now, of course, that's true. They started doing things that were right. And I can't argue with that, that they actually started doing certain things. I want to say two things about it. When most of the academics who used to say that, they had a very narrow set of policies, what they called right. And actually, if we look at what all these countries did, they did a, a vast plethora of policies, very different things, state-led, market-led, um, a strong state, a democracy, very different ways that they actually went about doing it. But at the same time, there's a lot of countries that also don't do it. And if it's all just getting the policies right, we seem to often behaving as if, well, we need to explain to, say, the Malawian government what the right policies would be. Look, Malawi, I'm sure it well, gets actually pretty bad deal in my book. Malawi has been doing this for 60 years, you know, and it actually very little change has happened. Um, definitely in the last 20, 30 years or 30 years after democracy came, it's still very little has changed. And so the question you have to ask, why don't they? And I don't want to believe the history, the kind of explanation that we sometimes hear, or we need to explain to them. We need to show them the evidence. No, no. There's a lot of things, sensible things that most governments could be doing, and many of them choose not to do it. And that's what you want to understand. Okay, that leads me then to basically the simple story of where I see this difference. And I'll, I'll have to hurry up a little bit. On the left-hand side, you see the prime minister's office in, in, in uh, Kinshasa, in the DRC. On the right-hand side, you see a drawing of the Ethiopian uh, prime minister's office. As coincidences have it, about seven years ago, I was, within a few months at a very similar meeting in both. And in both cases, I was there with the leading experts and they were going to tell me what they were going to do to the development plan, what they were going to do. And in Kinshasa, I was offered by a whole group. There was a very large group of people, uh, all the kind of chief advisors to the prime ministers, all advice to the prime minister. And they gave this beautiful plan. I mean, I had to say, wow, this is really thought through. How are we going to get agriculture going, infrastructure going, investment climate, macroeconomic stability, education, health, you name it, they had something for it. And this was really pretty good. They had a clear sense of the evidence. They had a clear sense of what to do. It. And I remember walking out of the room, uh, telling my, my colleague that I was with and saying, wow, this was quite amazing. Wasn't this an amazing piece of theater? Because nothing will happen of this. And of course, nothing ever happened with any of these plans. Meanwhile, we were in Ethiopia, not long after, and we were presented with, I would say, very flawed plans. They were really tricky things they were going to do. And we were there actually, they had invited several other people, Paul Collier, Justin Lin, Lan Pritchard, some of you will recognize these names. And uh, they, were, um, they were all there when we were debating with these people, um, you know, and high level people, central bank governor, minister of finance and so on, all very tech quite technocratic people. And, you know, we really worried about whether it's going to work and said, look, this will probably derail. This has a diagnosis of why this market isn't working well. It's probably not a good idea. And indeed, they were doing all kinds of things that I would say, hmm, not sure. But I remember all of us walking out and saying, wow, they're going to do this. And they're probably going to succeed because they will actually, if it doesn't work, correct themselves, try something else and they'll keep on going. And of course, in the period between 2010 and 2019, this was, uh, Ethiopia was the fastest growing economy in the world. And they did it. They didn't, they didn't do it with perfection, but they did it with, um, you know, clearly trying to, uh, to learn and do things. And that leads me to the kind of ideas I have in the book, the kind of a core part of the book which is basically saying, look, I borrow quite a bit from Douglas North, and I put it here and you can surely quickly read it. It's kind of a dense piece, but basically says, you know, you should think of a state always as some coalition amongst people with power and influence, some elite groups that somehow form a coalition that make the rules of who has access to resources, who controls the land, capital, labor, and who has access 
to and controls valuable activities, who gets the license to trade, who can get the education and so on. And sometimes can be more open, sometimes more closed. But actually a state, you could probably always see this as a way of overcoming as a coalition to actually say, look, when we are in control that, we can keep stability and then these rules of the game, they will help us um, then how we run the place. Now, of course, it could be quite ugly, very small group of people. It could be quite open. Now, I want to emphasize that even in very developed countries and very rich countries like the US or in Sweden, we have all kinds of controls on who gets access to valuable resources. We all have inheritance laws. So it means if someone was rich in the 13th century, the chances of their, uh, their offspring today are that they are still rich is pretty high. Now that's a rule that we set that say, okay, that's clearly someone in the 13th century and beyond has found it in their interest to keep these rules. And so we do have this. This is not just in bad functioning societies and we are perfect. We have all kinds of rules of the game in that sense as well. Now, that leads me down to the way I want to um, look at, at the, in the book, at it. just basically look at every state that you observe as somehow an elite bargain, a deal between the elite um, amongst those with power and influence, you know, and that could be not just the political leaders, and that's why I talk about an elite bargain. This is rarely just about political leaders. There's also leaders in business, senior civil servants, sometimes the military, sometimes top people in civil society, in universities, and so on. And they kind of, every state you meet, there is the, uh, there, there, you can think of it, it's in the, min in the minimal around or, or already a kind of a coalition for stability, you know, where you set certain rules of the game, who has most to say at one moment, who can do certain things, not do things. But it's a, it's a way of keeping the place stable and peaceful. But it always involves some kind of political deal, who controls the decision-making in the state, but also an economic deal, who, for example, has access to the resources of the state, who has access to the jobs in the state, who has access to the resources in the economy, the rules that are set for how an economy would function, are we allowing monopolies? Are we not allowing them? Are we granting licenses to import and whatever? So it's basically always a bit of a political deal and an economic deal. And that's quite, quite central and quite key in the way I want to think about. And every society has this, and I want to emphasize, you know, no society is perfect. You know, uh, I come from Belgium. You know, if you don't have a party card, you can't be a top civil servant top civil servants are allocated based on political connections. That's not just meritocracy, that's political connections. It wasn't the case in, in, the, in the UK. But uh, if you go to the US and you have a lot of money, you have a really big influence in politics because party financing and political financing is very liberal there and so on. We have all these games. Of course, you also get in developing countries where you get kleptocracies, where a state seems to be organized largely as an instrument to steal from, the, from, from everybody uh, in, in society, including from business, and then trying to divide it amongst a very small group of people. You could have clientelist states where most of the jobs in the state are created as a reward for those people who supported you to get elected, or indeed you make sure that your ethnic group or another group gets the return and so on and so on. You can have all kinds of states. Now, what does that have to do with development? I actually something very simple. You know, and my contention, my, my fundamental point of the book is that, you know, we can keep on talking about the policies and the whole kind of things, but fundamentally, you'll get development, uh, or at least you need as a, uh, an essential precondition for development, that those in the elite and the underlying bargain of the elite or of power and influence and the political and economic deal in that society involves also a shared commitment towards growth and development. Now, don't take it for granted that it exists. If I have a lot of natural resources, I may not have to choose for that because I can make my small group of people that are in power really rich without doing any growth or any development. I can explain the DRC very simply like that. There is no shared commitment of those with power in anything to do with growth and development because you need, don't need it. And basically, you, 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 you need these things. Now, it needs to be more than words by the leader. It needs to be something to do with credible politics because otherwise 
the stability won't be there. It needs to be really shared amongst the political class and also amongst the other parts of the elite in the way they, they allow the politics to play out. But as a state, you know, what it requires, it needs to be self-aware. You know, it needs to be, and the point really is, if you have strong state capability at the moment, you'll have that commitment in your elite. Well, maybe you can use the state to do it. This is 1979. You at least have something to fall back on in China of 2,000 years of centralized taxation, 2,000 years of a meritocracy in a bureaucracy, um, and 2,000 years of centralized power. Communist Party deciding to do development and growth, leaning quite a lot on the state, although it had to then decentralize power and so on in its governance reforms in 1979 and beyond. You can do it via the state. When Bangladesh in the early 1980s came out of a really difficult period, first the independence battle and, and, the, and the loss of, a, of, a, of the pre-existing elite, a new elite emerging, but then a country hit by famine and a lot of political instability in the 1970s. That state was actually very weak. And actually it's been well documented that quite a lot in growth and development was achieved because the state didn't try to control it. There was quite a lot of less affair in the, in the private sector. Think of the garment industry that managed to emerge. There was actually quite a lot of less affair in the social sectors where NGOs were allowed to deliver social, uh, a lot of the, of the things in the social sector with BRAC becoming the largest NGO in the world, delivering a lot of the essential service for the poorest in the society. There is no country in the world that I think would ever allow an NGO to become as powerful and as big as BRAC and Grameen as Bangladesh did. That's a self-aware state allowing you to do it. Of course, you need to be able to correct, you have to learn. It's not straightforward, you can't get it wrong. You need to have a process of accountability. So it can't just be ideology of development. It has to be action. If you go back to the 1970s, I have a lot of time for Julius Nereri, but there was nothing of this last thing. It was all ideology, we're going to do it. And we couldn't quite uh, pull it off. So keep in mind, and I've said it already, it doesn't have to be perfect institution, it doesn't have to be market or the state. There's a lot of these countries did it in different ways. It also doesn't necessarily have to be a democracy. And that's actually quite important. A lot of people get a bit annoyed with me, but the evidence suggests that performance is not, especially at the takeoff at the lower levels of GDP, it's not really correlated with political freedom or not. And you see that, of course, empirically. You know, you have China being quite successful, but you have Ghana as well quite successful. Ghana is a democracy. But also think of Malawi as a democracy and not doing anything. Nigeria is a democracy, not achieving anything. And it actually has a lot to do with, yeah, I could say the imperfections in it. I don't really think so. It's in itself, it is a lot to do with the nature of the elite commitment. I love democracy and I wish there was more, but it's not the essential feature of it. And now finally, it is a gamble. A political elite that gambles on it. Actually, and then we have it very clearly in, in, in say in 2005 in Ethiopia, uh, where the elite that is in control actually has a very fragile political deal between the different groups in its coalition. But actually it thinks that it gambles on development, on growth, as a means of gaining legitimacy from the population. Actually not very dissimilar how the Chinese Communist Party gambled on it as a way of keeping population on site in the, in the 1990s in, in China, sorry, in the 1980s in China and in the, in, after 2005 in Ethiopia. But it can backfire. In Ethiopia, the political deal, the coalition of power actually then collapsed more recently, even though the gamble was done. Anyway. For me, that's an obvious story and I've implied it already. An elite that wants it in Ethiopia, there was a clear sense that they wanted it, even with all their imperfections, they were trying to do it in the DRC, they were not doing it. Uh, this is a bit of in the book, different countries. I, I'm not going to uh, stay too much in it, but you get a glance at it, you'll recognize your favorite countries there, uh, where there's development bargain, somewhere I'm getting optimistic about and others where I, I think there's none present. Um, how do we know it? Well, it has to be about actions. It can't be about predictors in history. It has to be about intent, not more, more than intent, but also with actions and behaviors. Okay, so the way I would say it, how would I know my country is moving towards one? Well, actually those with power are beginning to tackle real vested interests, very difficult reforms to start doing it. In Malawi, for example, the moment they start, they're going to start really tackling the agricultural parastatals, 
I think there's a chance we get some progress. Before that, I can't see anything. Let me then come to the final five minutes, which is basically what can outsiders do? And it's basically, what do we do then in development? Okay, I have this little proviso because in a world of geopolitics, we're getting a bit worried that international uh, donor agencies maybe get less interested in development and all getting more interested in, in, um, in other things. So I put this there, but let's assume we still want development in all the countries that we're dealing with. Well, some people would say, well, what's the worry? We have the shared commitment now globally for growth and development. We had the Millennium Declaration, of which is the photograph, followed by the MDGs soon after, and then the SDGs in 2015. Isn't it wonderful? We have the shared global commitment to growth and development. Our job is done. They've all signed. Well, I'm not entirely convinced about this. Okay, so for me, the SDGs and the MDGs before, there's some kind of blueprint where we suddenly behave as the whole world is committed to turn the world into Sweden. And actually not Sweden as you know it, but probably Sweden as I know it as a Belgian where we started thinking, oh, well, that in the, when I was growing up, the perfect society, the Swedish model, all getting the equalities right, the growth right, the democracy right, the tolerance right, all the kinds of things. I worry a bit about, there's no country that has developed by first turning itself into Sweden as I've described it just now, which doesn't even exist. Actually, Sweden never developed in that way as well. I'm going to surely get pushed back from all of you. Um, but what I'm actually more worried about is not just that the blueprint is, is so unrealistic and, and has no sense of history of how development comes about. I just look at the picture. I see Vladimir Putin there. I see a lot of unsavory characters that actually were involved with, um, were actually indicted by the International Court of Justice for Crimes Against Humanity. Several of them that we know or indeed have been sanctioned for grand corruption and a lot of other unsavory regimes. The problem with the SDGs is that for those countries that really have already a development bargain, a lead bargain for growth and development, they don't need New York to actually say it. It's nice to have. It's a nice way than to, to actually saying we all, we all agree on that. But for those who have no commitment to development, of which there are lots of heads of states on this picture, well, there's no credibility to it. There's nothing there. It doesn't bind them. This is, not, this is a commitment that is not credible. And that's the important part of a development bargain. It has to be credible and it has to be uh, reflecting in actions. But it also has important implications finally for aid. Well, you know, if you're a country with a development bargain, actually aid is easy. I'm definitely not here to go and bash aid. In fact, in, for example, Ghana and Bangladesh, aid was actually really essential part of the progress that they've made. Aid is a little bit like dancing the tango. You know, it should be led by someone and I think it should be led by the country. Uh, ownership matters here, the country should lead. And then you dance the tango, and if you're both really committed to dancing the tango, well, then actually aid is quite easy. We can do quite a lot of good stuff. We can do working with these governments, really helping them to make progress and actually doing things. I think that's what we did in Ghana and in Bangladesh quite effectively. And to some extent in Ethiopia during this key period as well, despite all the troubles that we can do. But try to imagine dancing the, pol dancing, sorry, dancing the tango with a country that's leading and that actually wants to dance the polka. So if it's dancing the polka and you try to dance in the tango, of course, it's going to be an absolute mess. And that's basically, you start to ask yourself, if the country doesn't want to develop, what am I doing with it? I'm definitely not doing development. At best, I may try to do some good, but we use all kinds of language that actually is really illusory and actually is dishonest and we should be more um, humble. And it's basically, we may be doing good, but I have one extra point to make on that. I also worry in a lot of countries where we do this, we risk, uh, we, we respond to a minister of health because they said, look, I really want to do health. But meanwhile, the elite bargain doesn't care at all. I'm thinking of Ni Nigeria for most of the last decade, which was the country that spent least on health as a share of its government budget of anywhere in the world. Now, do we need to give that aid to that country, even though it's spending on all kinds of quite uh, far less important things? 
Well, we give them definitely an excuse. We give them an excuse to actually not do anything. We're actually helping that elite bargain to stay at parallel elite bargain. And that actually is quite important. We're not doing development, but we actually risk to do harm. And that's sort of, of course, the last that we want to do. And all conditionality or results-based aids, we could have a long conversation that I don't think it matters that much. So what can we do? Let me very quickly say in the last minute, everywhere, we can definitely do internationally things that really should encourage countries that are moving to a development bargain or already have one. And that actually is quite a, almost maybe a punishment for countries or way of avoiding very bad development, very bad elite bargains that are non-developmental. So for example, it's very hard for a country to export. It needs a really concerted effort of governments, you know, giving trade preferences and really much more favorable as we do at the moment, even import substitutes from some countries. I would be great, I'm not very much in favor of it. At the same time, you know, we worry about often about illicit finance, tax havens and so on. We usually argue about the wrong point. It's not about tax. I never wanted to give a lot of money back to Kabila. Kabila would have wasted it. It would have been a waste of money to get all that illicit finance back to Kabila. And I'm tempted to say with Buhari the same. Actually, the main problem with illicit finance is it keeps these regimes in, uh, in operation. That's how politics is financed in these places, via contracts from the mining companies, favoring certain families, certain things, and then managing to get the money back to these leaders that then have a lot of money to spend. In the countries, the minimal I would say, you can't just do development in a neutral way. You are a political actor. You are shifting the incentives of the politics in these places when we do it. So maybe you should do, and the book has a lot in the last part, a lot on that, how you could probably do this, whether you do reform, but you should really be aware that, that you are risking embedding the status quo. So I'll stop now. And I want to emphasize here, you know, what we don't want is to peddle technocratic solutions and thinking we can have easy solutions. But if we are working countries with a development bargain or where we think it's emerging, and we can talk more about it, how we could recognize them, I think we should really support them very strongly. But at the same time, we should be wherever else that we should have no illusions what we do. I have nothing against doing humanitarian aid and actually, or even do, trying to do good. But we should always ask, am I risking making it worse? For me, a really crucial moment was when I really started changing my mind was in South Sudan, talking to a rebel commander when the civil war was raging and we had flown with the UN helicopter into rebel held territory to look at how the, the support by the NGOs was, was going and by the UN was going. And talking to that rebel commander, I asked him what he thought of these NGOs because some of them had been there for 30 years giving emergency aid. And he simply said, you know what? I really like them here because it allows me to focus on the important business of war. And so basically we were essentially helping to prolong the conflict there. And that was a really crucial thing. Anyway, we should really think carefully therefore of how these countries function, their politics. And when we think about how to support them, think so carefully about the, the points of the entry points for change and how, but also how we may embed bad elite bargains. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Ercon. I hope you can hear me now. Yes. All right. So um, we have a few questions, but I'm, I'll probably kick, kick it off with my own question. I have a very, very fundamental question here. I mean, uh, what do the findings of this book actually mean for or development research. In other words, is there a scope to do more research uh, on these issues? And what questions should, should we be asking? And how should we approach these questions? Shall I quickly take this? Yeah. Um, so, so no, that's an excellent question. So there's two things here. I think, first of all, as researchers, um, uh, uh, first of all, as researchers, we should learn to be a bit more modest and when we are talking about you know if you do this this will happen or these are the policy implications to actually you know sometimes saying look this is really not where you either could start 
or you know once you were if you were to act on this what would be the further effects in the local political economy and what would happen and i think we should learn to be a bit more humble in the way we do uh do to some of our work the second thing is so so it's you know we we all these statements about what works and so on you know many of these things will work in countries where 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 the partners you work with in governments or in power really want it to work and then you can actually get things done so so we should just be a bit more careful uh, on this so it's my primary concern is that i would like us to have more impact in the interventions and that also means in the advice that we give and that relates to a second point is that you know the our advice, our technical advice, that are, and also the questions we research, you know, the, the why we get certain outcomes in certain contexts have a lot to do with a, with the political economy. So you should be willing to see how can I actually integrate some more political economy analysis in the way I do work. I can refer to a paper by uh, Darona Simoglu and Jim Robinson in Journal of Economic Perspectives in 2013. Who actually really in an interesting way try to actually uh, explain this but and then and then we should actually be studying you know uh, much more combining our economic understanding we shouldn't leave it to political scientists because they don't understand economics very well uh, we should also it's not just about the politics it's often to do with you know how how um, how particular economic um, interventions how how particular advice we give how that actually may work through the political economy um, but we need to know the economics at the same time we should be willing to learn more of, of the economic uh sorry more of the political science yes they had a brilliant conversation with someone based in managua in nicaragua and he was actually saying well we rarely study also the the preferences of the elite we take for granted that governments actually have preferences that are the same as ours i we want development we want growth and we actually don't do that either. So there would be certain bits that we could study as well. But my main thing is I think for research is to actually find ways of integrating uh, how political equilibria and economic, uh, economic interventions interact. Thank you very much. We have a, a number of uh, audience questions here. So I'll pose one of them. And uh, there's a specific case study here been mentioned, Ghana. Um, and it has been touted as a beacon of democracy in Africa and so on and so forth. Yet um the dividends of uh, of development uh, is concentrated uh, among a few of the elites widening inequalities between the rich and the poor um and also perception of corruption is quite high and uh, accountability is suboptimal yes. the question is could ghana have grown expo exponentially as china with other strategies and this is coming from prince of Bain. very good this is uh this is an excellent uh question so you know for me, success in, in this uh, in, in, in the conversation we're having, it, there is something relative about it. You know, expecting China style style growth rates is uh, is being very unhelpful for most of the world. Okay, um, and and even East Asian growth rates, it was an exceptional period in the global economy as well. What I could take advantage of. Um, could Ghana uh, has Ghana grown in the most optimal way? Oh no, absolutely not. And that's actually very striking. Um, similarly, in Bangladesh, we could easily say, you know, it's grown five to six percent for the last fifteen years. It could have probably done easily a percentage or two more. No, easily I use that word. No, no. Realistically, uh, this is actually already quite an achievement. So, lots of things could have been better. But but it's actually part, at the core of my book as well. Is that is that phenomena like corruption? um and imperfect democracies they are they're part and parcel of historical progress virtually everywhere in the world but actually what i'm quite impressed by and i'll tell you why i would actually still suggest that ghana is a success story that the in the 90s the the the, the deal that seems to have emerged you know with a call it an imposed constitution by jerry rawlings an imposed constitution that definitely didn't have you know everybody happy with but within constraints within some tricks of constraints in it with on ethnic politics and so on somehow or another the political elite actually decided they could have played decided to play by these rules 
they could have played in different ways as well. And I think one of the successes that actually the elite chose political stability, which had been lacking in Ghana. And political stability was the first thing it gets delivered by a politics that where when people were defeated, were willing to actually not keep on trying to fight it for very long and actually respecting the outcome of the elections and then keeping some sense of political stability. Now, that was an important part because it gave that space uh, to combine with some reasonable, some, some kind of pragmatic economic policies to do quite well. And uh, the quite the the quite the quite well is important okay um the looking for perfect institutions we can we could have waited forever but in that sense ghana has done considerably better than say in nigeria it's now surpassed in gdp per capita and actually nigerians don't like it to be emphasized but ghana has done and yes corruption is high and accountability is is less but political scientists are also increasingly documenting how, for example, politics is increasingly more fought at a local level based on results and outcomes. It's less about simple patronage and clientelism. And so you get some of these forces that are pro progressive. And, uh, you know, I'll take Ghana as a success, I will still call it, because it's in the midst of, of, of incredibly poor outcomes. And of course it can get much better. And that's Indonesia is interesting. It's all the time working progress. And gradually it's doing a bit better and a bit better in all these things. And I think that's the historical evolution. And maybe it can, we can go fa faster. You know, the development progress in Ghana is there. Of course, it would be nicer and better if there was less inequality and so on. But again, similar to Indonesia or Bangladesh, you know, I'm happy to start taking some of that progress and I'm willing to call them quite successful because we have so few of them actually on the continent. Thank you, Prof. We, we still have quite a number of very, very important uh, questions from the audience. So we'll try and keep it. I'm going to be shorter. I'm going to be short. Uh, there's one request that maybe you provide uh, the title of the paper you, you, you referred to by uh, Asimo Glenn Robinson, the Journal of Economic Perspectives. Um, the, the next question is from Matthew Osborn. And uh, he says that requiring a political elite to gamble collectively on future growth requires a degree of homogeneity of this group, or at least this would be an advantage uh, advantage to develop trust and coordination. Does this mean that the countries with significant ethnic and or religious heterogeneity may be at a disadvantage? Uh, has this come out in your analysis? And if so, how can this be managed? Or yeah. are such countries always at a disadvantage? And there's another question that connects it quite uh, well. It says that if democracy isn't absolutely necessary, which is something that you mentioned, and development is being dri driven by political elites willing to gamble on development. What agency do poor people have in this process? Do they have a role or is it up to external experts to ensure that political elites are doing what they should be doing on behalf of their nation's poor? And after that, we have a series of questions that I think we okay. can uh, uh, give some short answers to them. Thank you. Um, yeah. So the, can you give me one word of the first one again? It will go back. I was writing something down. What was the first that you mentioned? It says that uh, does this mean that the countries with significant oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. ethnic yeah. 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 so so look so, so we we living in a world of imperfection, okay? And uh, there's historic history matters. You know, I'm not going to try to deny history. Colonial history will matter, and colonial history del delivered a lot of that. Uh, of, of borders of countries with, with ethnic uh, diversity, religious diversity, and so on. So there's all kinds of factors. You know, I come from Belgium, where we have lots of language groups, where very little homogeneity. And yes, I would say that, um, that, that, it, that, that, of course, it doesn't allow us to do what, for example, in China could be done, where the vast, vast, vast majority of Han Chinese and, and, and the history that I described. China had advantages. Now, yes, there's disadvantages, you know, and I'm, I'm also never expecting Malawi to start growing like Singapore or, or things like that. But the interesting thing is, it's the way you begin to overcome these things as an elite. That's, that I find most impo important. And I'm, I'm linking on to link the two questions. Take, for example, I'm actually getting more optimistic about Kenya than I used to be. You know, Kenya should actually be a far more dynamic country since independence. It, uh, it, it was delivered with a, with, with a lot of opportunity. It has all kinds of endowments that it could have benefited from and so on. And arguably, economically, it was very poorly run. 
Uh, and then you also had a lot of instability due, due to ethnic politics. The constitutional reform after the violence of 2007, is it 2007 or 8? I forget now the, the exact date, but when the election violence, violence was very, very severe, um, you know, the constitutional actually did something quite clever because one of the basis of why, why the ethnic strife came so to a head, because the presidential system that they had was so much gave basically so much control to the president and so basically the real battle was all the time who, do, who controls the presidency because then you control the state as an instrument for clientelism and patronage actually they they did decentralization so it means that um and i sometimes joke to my friends in kenya to say you've decentralized corruption but actually it helped you with your stability it actually basically if you don't win the presidency now you actually can go local so it's the way you look for your solutions and basically a governor now still has quite a lot of power and influence and that's a, a key part do poor people then have any agencies well i i'm i start with a with, a, with maybe an unfortunate fortunate realistic position where i say look in most societies lower groups don't have that much agency they can do agitation they can do pressure and and and, and within certain systems there's more than others but there is an important part, and again, China is interesting, but Indonesia as well, in very different ways, Indonesia in the 1970s, uh, actually Ethiopia in, in, as well in, in after 2005, uh, as well as China in the 1980s. These were regimes that were at that time all quite autocratic, but they, they recognized that power required some form of legitimacy. And they actually needed to respond. And in Indonesia, it came from civil war before, and in Ethiopia, similarly, with lots of tensions and electoral defeat that they had suffered as a government in 2005, that actually the signals were there from below, that they actually didn't have enough legitimacy. So one reason why, why an elite can choose for growth and development is because they need legitimacy. So there is something to do with fostering shared commitment from below. And the book actually talks about ways that you can actually foster that. But I'm unfortunately trying to be quite realistic, is that actually, yes, the agency of the elite is so much more superior to the agency from below. To say that therefore needs experts, no. Experts have a minimal role. It's actually the elite itself that has to make these choices. And all the countries that have become quite successful, it's their elites that make the choices. The outsiders, they have a minor role. At best, we can support them if they take that choice, but there's no expert from outside who will actually make any leader that hasn't chosen a development bargain to make the leap towards a development bargain. Thank you very much. Uh, we, we're running out of time, uh, but if you can uh, give very, very short answers to some of these remaining questions, that would be highly appreciated. Uh, the, 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 this one is, uh, will concern for the environment complicate the development bargain, quite briefly, if you can pro provide some yeah. answers to that. And then the, this one is that probably you don't have to answer that, but you know, um, uh, Ragnar proposes something for you. He says, uh, this is a very important test for your thesis. Uh, an example is Malawi. Is getting a development bargain sufficient for a country with so few fewer resources? I mean, the country has a lot of other constraints on its development possibility. So, I mean, this is, uh, I guess, uh, an open question, but uh, would, would them concern for the environment complicate uh, the development bargain? Something that you can provide answers to. Okay, so quickly on the environment, uh, very quickly on the environment is the, um, you know, of course it, 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 it uh, concern with the environment, it complicates, but, but similarly, we, we, you know, without a development bargain, I don't see a country actually paying at all attention to, to uh, protecting natural capital or indeed getting concerned about global warming and so on. So it's actually more my concern is that uh, in a world where we, again, give a lot of uh, attention to uh, climate finance and so on, there's only going to be a subset of countries that actually will generally use it in a way that actually is, provides a useful resource. And I'm very concerned that a lot of climate finance that we're promising, that we've reduced it to a finance problem, but actually we also have to have a real serious commitment problem. And uh, I write in the book about the environment, chapter three touches, touches as well on it and in a few other places and I refer to it. A country like Malawi, it comes back to this point, you know, we can't expect too much. Uh, Malawi will never be Singapore. Malawi will never have extremely fast growth. It has low resources. It has some pretty good agriculture. 
Um, but at the same time, you know, it is uh, the only country that has had sustained peace amongst the 10 poorest countries in the world. It has sustained peace. Malawi should have done better. And it definitely can do a couple of percent of growth, a much better record in, uh, in, 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 in and, and, and much better record in getting its own service to work for the poor, much less the reliance just on aid. That is, a lot of it is just humanitarian stuff. There's very little change happening. I do put, uh, yeah, it, it, you know, a few percent more of growth in GDP per capita terms. I think that's what it can achieve. I'm not asking for much more, and I'm very confident that it actually could be. You know, I have a sentence in my book and say, Malawi should not be this poor. Malawi should not be this poor, and I will say this. It doesn't mean it should be, it can be easily get rich. Thank you very much. I, I guess we cannot continue uh, with the questions, but uh, we'll pass them on to Prof, uh, and then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll leave the answers back to you. Thank you so much for coming to talk to us about your book. Back to you, Janet. Yes, <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Stefan, for uh, your presentation and talking to us on this uh, very, very uh, interesting. And I definitely got an appetite to buy your book and read it and learn more about it. And I really uh, love that you are, things are not so easy, it's complicated. And we really need researchers to look at things like what is happening in uh, in different countries and different contexts and then talking to policymakers about this. So I'm really glad that you are doing it. And I know you're presenting your book to several policymakers. And so, so I really hope that you get uh, success there. Uh, and uh, uh, just uh, thank you all for participating in this dialogue and uh, you're welcome. We will have more of these dialogues uh, next coming in September, most probably we'll, if you want to know about the coming dialogues, please sign up to the Swedev newsletter. You'll we'll put a, a, a note on them in the chat on that. Uh, and we will uh, then invite other guests uh, to speak uh, and uh, hope we can uh, get spread the word about these dialogues as well and continue this work on bridging between research and policymaking. So uh, Thanks again, Stefan, and thanks everyone for participating. And thanks, George, for moderating. <laughs>